Good morning, or uh, yeah, <laughs> good evening. Good morning. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, sir. Good evening. I am. Um, Um, Austin, it feels like you're around the corner. Just seeing the name Austin feels like uh, you're not too far away. Alrighty. Um, I've got a few different things lined up. Um, Shridi, are you? Yep, you are. Yep. Uh, welcome everybody to the Nashri Nefa. It's 23rd December. Merry Christmas if you celebrate it. If you don't, happy holidays anyway. Uh, we have a pretty good agenda today, so let's start. Um, if you can see the meeting minutes on my screen, please go add your name to the attendees list. There's a link in the meeting minutes. If you can't access it, please speak up. We'll get you access. And that's it. That's all for the house cleaning items. Uh, let's start. I'm not sure what this is. All right, uh, so if you want to attend any of the DeFi meetings, there's a table, there's a handy table with all the links and all the links to the meeting minutes, to the meetings, to the YouTube uh, recordings, to the Slack channels, go check it out if you are short on any of the links. Leah, I'll let you take the lead on this one because I'm not sure what this is. Oh, uh, is Ruth here? Um, I, um, no, she's not. Um, but, but yep. But um, that conference, FOSDEM, is has been a longstanding tech conference focused in our area, and by our area, I mean just on this technological space. And um, good conference to get the word out at to to share at. Uh, so if any of you are thinking of s trying to speak at that one, um, I'm here to help and others are here to help. Uh, particularly if you want to talk about any, any of the projects that are going on here or the community here. So Ruth is going to um, submit. That's great. All right. Um, let's start with the agenda then, if you want. Is the call? Yeah, hello. Hey. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I had some, uh, my mic issues. Previously, I didn't hear anything, but uh, Lee was speaking, so I had to restart. Uh, close the zoom and restart. So. Oh, nice. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, we were gonna. We are just getting into your area, your bullet point. I figured you've done some some good work here. We could you could maybe walk people through it, and I think it's, it's still evolving a little. Uh, you you'd have some good suggestions, and so. Yeah, please please take people through what you've done. So, shall I share, share the screen? Yeah, sure. Okay, so for last two weeks, I have been working on automating, like automating the release notes so that it is automatically created uh, after every release. So, and uh, thanks to the EV, it was completed yesterday. And uh, uh, 
we are currently using the release drafter to draft the release for every uh, push us push of uh, PR. So, and uh, this is the workflow. Uh, uh, currently, we are this section here, like uh, creates the draft the uh, release draft for every push, and we have modified here for that it takes after uh, after after release it takes the drafted PR and creates a release file a markdown file under release dot uh, docs under underscore releases so that it automatically the uh, it automatically gets added to uh, gets added to the collection so then we can uh, check the release page so that every release we can view every release a uh, release currently and there is some amendments to be done in the release page as well and uh, this in this section we couldn't completely automate uh, this process uh, there's one manual process to be done that's after creating a release node we have to create a, a pull request to push the uh, created a release node to the repo and uh, we were trying it our best to automate it completely, but with uh, with GitHub, it's not the current work in the current implementation. It's not possible. So uh, the uh, currently after uh, cre it creates a pull request and uh, it's la it labels and we need uh, we need to uh, merge the pull request. That's it. And uh, we have after every release. That's the process. Nice. Who, who's got? So, by the way, the backstory here is <clears throat> that that this particular piece of work is one of our longer-standing issues. Like, uh, I think what are we on? Like issue two thousand two hundred or something, <laughs> and this one was like issue five hundred from not this last September, but like a year and something ago, September. <clears throat> um, some of us, even maybe some of us on this call have uh, volunteered to take tackle this before, um, but it wasn't until um, Sudan, um, by the way, um, yeah, by, until Sudan came that uh, it got done. So this is nice. There's, um, to reflect on what's written here, actually the, the fact that you've pointed out that you can, oh, trigger a workflow based on a release. I have no idea how we missed that before. That's so obvious and so much more helpful than really, uh, we have a little bit of a mess uh, between if, if everyone can see the build and release YAML and the CI YAML, it's the two files uh, in the workflows folder. Um, th these two CI.yaml and build and release YAML are pretty similar, or like really similar. One's a bit, has a few more steps than the other, <clears throat> but the primary reason that we have two separate workflows um, here between build and release and CI.yaml was because we're, you know, the other contributors in the community have been trying to figure out how to well, um, you, you know, trigger builds on when someone creates a PR and when they push to that PR, when they create a branch, push commits to it, it's nice that the CI kicks off and builds, you know, that, that work in progress or tests it out. And that's desirable. Um, it's the same or very similar process that's desired for when a, a stable release is made or an edge release is made. But those, and then, and then Abhishek, did you, did you want to chime in? <clears throat> cool. I think, he, um, <laughs> and, but, but, uh, so anyway, the, my point is we have two different files workflows that pretty much do the same thing and they're separated because we didn't have great control over um, when they were triggered. So we're triggering them too frequently 
we really need to ideally sit on, we would consolidate the CI.yaml and the build and release.yaml into a single workflow and just conditionally execute certain portions based on whether or not a, um, whether or not an, the artifacts just need to be built and tests need to be run, which is that's what needs to happen when someone does uh, opens a PR or when they push a new commit to a PR. When that PR is merged, um, we need to make a new edge release. So every time a PR is merged, we'll, you know, we'll just, there'll be a new edge release. And then thirdly, when we make an official release with a tag and we version the number, um, which is an actual release event, when we actually have a release event that's, that's associated with this stable release. And so there's a bit of refinement that can happen based on inclusion of that action or that, that uh, event type. Now, Saran, do you know, because I'm confused, uh, at the top where we, you know, the first like 10 lines, we, what we're saying is, you know, this is the name of the workflow and this workflow will be triggered when these things happen. When a push event happens against, well, not against the docs directory, but against the master branch and in the presence of a tag, um, which makes sense. Like what we're trying to say there is, oh, hey, this should really only initialize when there's a release tag present. So meaning this is intended to only kick off on release. Yeah. So like actually changing it to on release uh, might be the right thing to do here. That might save us. I think there's still some repeating of ourselves between the two files, but that's something that we can address over time. Immediately, like when, whenever you do a push to um, a PR to a branch, you, kick off these, these two workflows kick off and it takes forever and it's a waste. And so. Yeah. Using release would be easier. Much easier. Yeah. I got to know the release event uh, today morning, actually after reviewing the last bit of code in the release drafter. Oh, nice. Yeah, well, now thanks to you, now just after that, I've learned about the release event as well. Now everybody here knows about it, hopefully. So yeah, hopefully we'll be able to be more intelligent and more selective on the triggers. Yeah. This is good. Anybody else have comments for um, Sudan here? So hopefully everyone's that would like the the, the summary is we have release drafter as a bot that will capture up all the, the change log, all the release notes from the last time that a release was made. So all the merge, all the PRs that have merged, um, that's helpful, but that automation is just putting those release notes into GitHub's release section for each of our repos. The documentation for Meshery in this case, that, that documentation site, it's a Jekyll site, it runs on GitHub pages. It has a page called releases and it just captures those same release notes in a convenient location inside the docs. And it had, has so far been a manual process to every time that a release is made to go over and manually copy over the release notes. And so what's happening here is that, that that's changed. So now the docs will be almost automatically updated. Uh, what will happen is based on, okay, well, to, so hopefully I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna take you through this. And did you talk about, Sudan, did you talk about the protected branch and the rules that we have on the master branch? Uh, no, I, like, I, I didn't particularly mention it, but I mentioned that we, uh, we won't be able to like push a commit through a flow to the master branch. I didn't explain it in details. Just to add to that, so this automation will only take it so far as create generating a PR so that someone can review and merge. It won't merge 
it won't um, merge the PR because the master branch has a has a protection rule on it that requires a user or at least one a review from at least one other person other than the person who has created the PR. And yeah, and that's not something that you can override here. So, so nice. Any other feedback for Sudan? Nice. Very good. That is nice. I, you just, yeah. Now you, we're going to have to give you a, uh, like a tattoo on your shoulder about uh, GitHub Actions. You can mm -hmm. find yourself swimming in uh, workflows. There's a lot of them. We use a lot of them. So. This is great. Like, uh, I have one more suggestion. Like, I think I previously mentioned here, like, if when we use these two labels, like this release note will be added to the next draft. I think, yeah, uh, this uh, push will be a, a record in the next draft. So if we can have a separate uh, label for only for automated release documents, so we can uh, exclude it from the release draft. Nice. Yeah, that'll work. Um, yeah, we, we can, we can designate one, honestly, like, like the thing about something like that is like, that would work. That would be helpful. It's kind of a nice to have, honestly, what will end up happening is you'll spend time working on it. You'll put that logic into release drafter somewhere in here, <clears throat> and then someone else will review it. And you'll, if you've type mistype as frequently as I do with my fat fingers, you'll your YAML will be incorrect, we'll merge it, there'll be an issue, then we'll have to go back and fix. It'll take longer than it's worth. Like, um, you should work on something else, is what I'm saying. And there's there's actually a, a bunch of other things. Um, some of the, the ideas that I was um, tossing out earlier, I, yeah. it's, not worth it. it's not worth it. It's just more code to maintain. I forget, it. it doesn't really matter if we have an extra pull request every release that says uh, release notes were automatically merged. at least for now, just because this one, actually getting this right, for my part, I think it took me, I'm not sure, 12 uh, PRs, <laughs> because it's hard to test um, GitHub um, actions, GitHub workflows. Uh, some of you are familiar with <clears throat> utilities that you can run um, GitHub's runners locally on your machine. Although it just never it hasn't worked for me. Like the environments aren't the same. The environments aren't the same. And, and because of that, you can try to test GitHub action workflows locally. Ha Sudan, have you been testing them locally? Uh, no, like I uh, use to testing these. I used one of my personal repos to creating a draft and pushing it just to check yep. how it works. Yep. But even at that, you didn't have access to the same secrets which, by the way, is something that we can enable in the repo. The problem with enabling it is the secrets then become available to any of the contributors, of which there's like 150 members. And then, so anyway, my point, to, my point of saying all that is it ain't worth it. That other enhancement that you're talking about, since you can't test locally very well, and since, yeah. But so far, so good here. This is, this is great. Any, anything else? Um, nothing from my side. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Right. Uh, instead of a tattoo, maybe a member profile would be the better way here. We should get you one. Sit down. What? Sorry, I, I didn't hear you properly. Uh, we should get you a member profile on left side. Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, Drew, you're up next. Oh, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, let's talk about a few of the changes which are being made in the learn day file repo, right? So, currently, I guess there's an update in the protocol which we are using for the SMI test. We are now using the service mesh protocol which is present in our 
SMP protocols where we have defined all the meshes to define the request of one particular mesh. Like before, we were uh, doing it manually using string, but since we have a place where we have defined all the meshes properly, it, it is logical to use that itself or the request itself. So now we are using uh, that from the SMP protos itself. And along with that, there are also a few changes we made to the structure of the data which we are getting from the SMI test, right? So the response is a bit renewed from now. Mostly the changes are the details which you get uh, while invoking each of the uh, spec. So yeah, these are a few other changes. And yeah, also including that, we have also uh, imported controllers from which we could check the, the current, uh, what do you say, the current status of the test itself using the um, controllers, right? The info and health controllers, which are part of the mesh kit itself. Oh, yeah. S say more on those. Uh, well, we haven't implemented the logic yet, so we would have to do that. But if you want to see what those protos looks like, let me try. Yep. So, yeah, it is a pretty simple and normal one, as you can see. The status itself and the health. Okay. Of controller. Are these controllers and this health is standard part of um, uh, the operator SDK? Uh, the operator SDK, in, uh, what sense I think? Get your... uh, um, yeah, they are not exclusive to SMI, if that's what I'm about. I guess uh, Abhishek wrote it in a way that it could be used generally for any thing which we're working on. Okay, gotcha. Oh, uh, that was that the question, or were you asking something? Yes. Else? Um, well, it's actually, actually, now that I'm, I'm realizing that we're talking about mesh kit, it's a bad question. Um, uh -huh. Okay. So, so yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice though. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess also one thing to add would be we are also updating the SMP protos. The basically the service mesh which we are defining we are also adding few things like the version of the mesh and stuff like that which was not yet included all we had was uh, all we had was a list of all the meshes as well so we are also now defining uh, having a variant where you can also specify the version i don't think like how the heck do we miss that um do you mind briefly going over to the other proto the um, uh, the SMI proto or the, uh, the ser service mesh performance proto in uh, without the PR. You mean? It, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, this is what we have defined for a mesh for now. Got you. But then in the um, if you go yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. It was defined somewhere. So we have SMP version. Yep. Um, service meshes, application data, mesh build. Okay. So the version over here is not the version of SMP. It defines the version of the mesh you are running. So let's say if you are running Istio and it has a version. 1.2 let's say then. yeah well okay but, uh, but i think the intention for smp version on line 140 mm -hmm. was is to track the version of smp itself uh -huh. although all those this variable this very well may, may need to change and i think even if the service mesh version was called out in the service mesh in this proto it probably, yeah, there, there's some work that needs to be done here. Like it probably does make sense to have that version number 
called out in the service mesh proto. I think, that, I think, I think that's a good move. Mm. Um, yeah, like it makes logical sense. And I don't think uh, it's compulsory for anyone to use it. It's not a mandatory fee, so that's that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, there's some... There's... Yeah, but to add to that, if we were already defining it over here, then I don't think we were, but uh, yeah, it shouldn't be over here. It should be in the service mesh itself, which we are defining. Yeah, that that build is a kind of a question, um, but we should probably since but but we know since that portion of this proto isn't being used, it may make sense to. Hmm. hmm. Okay. Yeah. You know what? Um, on a, the, this is a good conversation for another call because uh, there's a, a few considerations to account for here. So. But the, the PR that you have is, looks pretty good. I mean, I think that's the right direction. Yep. Uh, uh, and also about, uh, to add to that, we can now mess around with it because we have like defined the version for the SMP proto switch we're using. So if we push any of this commits, it won't make a difference in the mission code base itself. So actually on that, um, the way that we approached it, was a temporary my... approach, yeah. Okay, and just for my own, for everyone's edification, probably it's worth looking at it inside of the meshery, um, meshery code where we import um, this spec, this package. Oh yeah, let me see if I can. <clears throat> the um. <clears throat> Udkarsh, you may need to chime in here because Udkarsh helped fix this. Yeah. I think. Um, uh, actually, yeah, that last, the, the last, oh, yeah, that would work as well. That's fine. Uh, so, Drew, I think you were, you know, conceptually taking the right approach where you're pinning um, what version we want to pull in. And that's a valid URL that you have there, um, but with this the is way not a proper solution, this is just a temporary thing. Okay, but even at that, it wouldn't build. Is the the problem? Yeah, actually, the build was failing, so we had to replace it again and uh, do oh, cool it. Okay. Yeah. So in its fine note, like not as a temporary solution, it's actually appropriate to pin to a specific version around protos like that, like that, that's okay. But but yeah, this particular format of the way in which it was done, it, it was causing the build to fail. And so the um, solution was Utkarsh to do what a go get, go get on this package, specifying the, basically to, to specify in go.mod instead of here. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, that actually makes more sense. Uh, yeah, totally. Instead of, yeah, then, specifying it in go.mod makes more sense. So but yeah. this is good work. Yeah. But uh, this is good work though. This is, uh, this helps us move forward. I mean, that's, that's the right thing to do. Uh, I'm just now thinking that why did I thought of that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like it was just so easy answer with it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that happened. Uh, yeah. So that's that. I guess if anyone has any questions or we can move on with the next agenda. Yeah, but for my part, Drew, I have a follow-up question about the mesh kit controllers. Pro probably I'll, I'll, I'll start that conversation in Slack just to. Okay. Oh, so yeah, I will hand it over to Siddhant, I guess. Um, okay, great. Thank you, Drew. Um, so Sarant, I don't believe is on the call. I'm not sure that he got the invite today. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be presented to him. Here's an open question for um, everyone here. 
and everyone who's watching the recording. And that is that <clears throat> that is that, that there's consideration to use the um, a dis distroless as the base image for meshery adapters. So anyone who's run meshery is both extremely pleased and somewhat dismayed at the same time by the fact that there are, well, soon to be, well, actually, it's a good point. Gosh, there's soon to be 10 um, adapters. Uh, Utkarsh, you've got some news, I think, to share in that regard. But uh, so they're both pleased about it and dismayed by it because uh, you have to sit there and watch as container images download and get pulled from Docker Hub. So the smaller that those are, the better. Um, so good. In that sense, it makes it's intu makes intuitive sense to go ahead and move to the smallest size image you can kind of get to. The a challenge, or this also, there's a trade-off like almost everything in life and all the decisions that we make here is that when you do use a dist or this base image, you lose things like ping or um, net stat or a bunch of other basic troubleshooting, you know, Linux utilities that you would sort of naturally expect to be available when you're trying to troubleshoot things like, oh, I don't know, connectivity to Minikube from the adapter. Um, and it becomes a little bit bothersome. And I don't know that everyone's well oriented to doing something like a Docker attach or like um, about how to troubleshoot running containers that don't have dev tools in them. Um, there's other approaches. It's, um, but uh, that that's mostly what I was gonna what Sirant was gonna talk about today, and just kind of a discussion around proliferating the use of distroless. Comments on this, McCool. This could be if we do take the distroless space image across the adapters, this could be a good and easy win for you. Hey, uh, just to point, uh, uh, since the concern is around the losing certain Linux uh, commands for dice uh, I think uh, we can also look at uh, Alpine images, which are smaller, but they include all these utilities. Yeah, so Ishan, Great suggestion. Also, Sean, welcome. <laughs> nice Thank to, you. yeah. Uh, great suggestion, Sean. Um, as as we would have it, th that's unless I'm entirely mistaken. That's actually Alpine is the image that we're using okay. currently across that. So that's a like a beautiful suggestion, and that's in fact kind of what we're. So it's like that's like actually exactly the point is like well. Here's another base image that's slightly, that's even smaller, saves us a, shaves off a few megs, you know, times 10. Uh, but then it also comes with the hardship of not necessarily, so not necessarily having all of what you'd want. T two things to help us. There's a few, there's like three things to help us overcome this challenge. And that is one, enable users with control to, with easy control over not deploying all 10 adapters if they don't, want to use all those meshes. Okay, and then that way they're not as concerned about how long it takes to download them. Okay, that addresses one aspect or helps. Another aspect is, well, fine, I'm just using one adapter, but I'm having some trouble with it. I'd like to troubleshoot it. So I'll go ahead and exec in there. Okay, one, one thing to do is like provide some troubleshooting, a troubleshooting guide that says, hey, don't, don't do that. Do grab a, grab a busy box container or something else and attach it to your namespace. You know, like do a different approach to troubleshooting rather than execing in. Okay. Uh, the third approach is to build better instrumentation in the adapters themselves, such that if you're having, hmm, yeah, such that, and we have a little bit of that, like an example being if anyone, if you've all run used Meshery CTL, the CLI, if you do a meshery CTL system logs, you can see logs from the adapters. Okay, that, that's that's how you, like we would need to bring some additional troubleshooting tools, some additional instrumentation in the adapters to help overcome the lack of tooling in distroless. 
So having said all that, unless others feel differently or like it sounds like we're probably on a path to moving toward distroless. It, there's been about four people who've joined recently who said they'd like to work on some DevOps things. Um, a short article, a short um, guide, a troubleshooting guide in the Meshery docs as to how to approach troubleshooting using a distroless environment. That would be helpful. That would, Shridi, do, do you, can you take that note and open up a GitHub issue on that? Sure. Could be a good thing. And then with that, um, Ishan, thanks for mentioning that. Also, Ishan, welcome. Um, Shridi will tell you uh, it's your first time. And so, and so it's time to orient you. <laughs> and so please, please say hi to everybody. Please uh, introduce yourself if you would, just uh, so everybody can get to know you. Hey guys, uh, I've just joined the community now and uh, uh, basically I'm working as a product engineer with uh, Gojek and uh, uh, mostly my interest is uh, around uh, uh, custom operators uh, and Kubernetes API. So that's something that I'm looking to contribute to, to the machinery project. To start with, you're just in time. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, you're just in time. It's a big, as a matter of, yeah, good. Sean, there's a lot to say there. Um, That's nice. Uh, where, whereabouts in, in India are you? Uh, so I was in Bangalore, uh, but I'm at my <laughs> native place right now because of all this COVID situation. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, there's a contributor here, um, uh, Kush Trivedi, that had, I think, spent a little bit of time at Gojek. Um, oh, I see. I don't know that his, his name would ring a bell, but, but uh, nice. All right. Um, well, I'll, I'll, for my part, I promise to follow up with you on an introduction to operators. As a matter of fact, um, there's, there's a gentleman, um, Deb Kalra is okay. if you haven't been introduced or haven't had a chance to say hi, um, poke him if you would. He's uh, ready and waiting to give you a tour of the Meshery operator and mesh sync. Like, oh, cool. And, cool. Definitely. Yeah. Get in touch with him. Nice. All right. Shridi, what, what do we have next? Um, do we have Marcin on the call? Did he make it? Oh, Marcin. Uh, I don't, I don't see him. Oh, uh, well, then we're back to you, Lee. Okay. Yeah. Then, then let me give an update on, on his behalf a little bit. Uh, so, so, um, all of you are aware of our, uh, I don't know, almost two time running MVP on this call. Um, Mark. Martin, um, since last time that we've met, since this last week, he has taken it upon himself to help create an easy way to deploy meshery inside of a VM-based environment. Um, and so he's put together um, a vagrant package with some, an Ansible role for well, near as I can tell for, um, I think, whether you want to run mm, CentOS-based VMs or maybe other others in Hyper-V, I think as a target environment, I'm not quite entirely sure of all of the ways in which you can configure this and deploy it. Um, and maybe it's not uh, maybe I'm misinterpreting what he had said, and maybe this isn't specific to Hyper-V. He was just using that as an example hypervisor uh, to be able to take this VM-based environment and deploy using Vagrant. So uh, that was that was pr pretty neat. Um, something that, um, well, if you're familiar with the Kubernetes project, um, they have, uh, I forget what they're called, basically, um, you know, community plugins and community extensions, like um, 
this may fall into a category of things that are that I'm not that I'm not quite sure how much time um, everyone would be able to how much how much support we would be able to offer for this ongoing and spend um, time on it. But we do want to support this. It's pretty fantastic. Yeah, I guess yeah, it does support Hyper-V and VirtualBox. Pretty awesome. We want to uplift the work and offer it. You know, make, try to pull it into the project. Um, we could place it into the mesh reinstall folder and and see if it's a value to people. So, um, Sridi, I think just assuming that Martin is going to be desirous of that, but will you also create a GitHub issue there as well? So I think. Um, yeah, sure. Nice. That way his work can get a lot more visibility. That's good. Octant. Any comments on that? Anybody use Vagrant actively? Anybody, anybody in VM land? All of you ephemeral people, I guess that's the, okay. Cool, that's pretty awesome. All right, well, we've got 17 more minutes. Do, who's interested in talking about, well, I guess, yeah, I guess this goes without saying. Um, um, if Sean is, is interested in some of this, he just said, let's talk about some things that have happened recently with respect to meshery architecture and some new components. Actually, before we do, um, Anirudh, are you ready to demo this week on Meshery system context? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Uh, although I don't know how much of it you would actually get because of my internet connection. Oh. So, is my voice breaking? Uh, nope. Okay. I'll try sharing my screen. Okay. Hmm. Okay, just let me know when it's on. Yep, it's on. Okay, great. Um, okay, so let's. I'll just show you how it works. I'll remove. I'll currently delete the current config. So that's. Dot. So the uh, file default file name is config.yaml. And um, so I just do like I don't any command. Let's just say it's simply on metric itself. Um, it creates a config yaml with the default because the config file did not exist. And it creates a local with endpoint localhost 9081. Uh, you can modify this directly, but uh, I, I, I would not recommend that. <laughs> But you you could do like it's some it's better if you uh, don't mess with this and if you just want to use the CLI mesh system context create and then um, let's just say temp I have okay I've, uh, sorry I forgot the URL the uh, okay so I have token and URL okay create uh, then let's just say temp. Then I have URL. It can be um, comma uh, eighty eighty, and the token can be I don't know comma token dot token dot yaml. Okay, so it's a temp added temp context. So you have another context here. Okay, tokens, tokens, token didn't get added here. But yeah, uh, you have the endpoint here. And um, this is currently not working. Uh, so uh, this is not a valid endpoint. If I put a valid endpoint here, you'll be able to access um, the metric server. Other than that, you have system, uh, you have context create creation. You have context delete, or wait, I'll just demonstrate switch first. So switch, um, which I have local here. So 
it uh, now you have switched to local so the current context keeps track of uh, which context you're currently uh, working on then we do have adapters right now but uh, it, it's pointless to actually add any of those you, got, you, you see this adapter right so the adapters right uh, this would actually be the initial list of adapters that you would like to launch your um, how do we say it the uh, Meshri server uh, which are which are adopted you want to uh, create create while creating the mystery server this would keep uh, a list of that and adding this on the cli then would be annoying so you could simply do like uh, linkerd istio and i guess OSM. and uh, if you if you do system start and pass in context so this is not working right now so this this hasn't created yet so and you would i guess pass in context see this was the idea right passing in context or simply running start and having a um, context being taken from the uh, whichever whichever is active um yeah i think so it would be um for that you would specify context <clears throat> if you didn't want to use the current context. Otherwise, it would just sit, uh, mesh CTL system start would just assume that you want to start the current context. Yeah, okay, great. So uh, the, the part on launching uh, some number of adapters based on the context is something that's to be done. Other than that, we have context. Uh, so this is the system context. Oh, so you have create, delete, switch, and view. So it's self-explanatory basically. So you create a context, you can delete it, you can switch between contexts, and you can also view which is your current context. And yeah, the delete one's remaining. So uh, delete, I guess, let's just delete the time. And I've got some error. Invalid command, delete, okay. Yeah. System, context, delete. Yeah. Con context is king. I mean, you've got to give context to context. Otherwise, you're not going to. Context delete. Um, damn. No context to delete. Okay. It's deleted, but this is. Uh, um, I'll just save this first. Uh, let's just see what I get. And now let's delete it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I deleted the uh, context here, and so this this would be your main configuration. The other thing you could also do is um, system or any command you could pass in config and then the uh, pointer to the config file. So let's just say context. Um, what was the command? View. So you have context and uh, sorry, not context config and your file would be home.meshri and this is config.yaml. So here it is. You can pass in a config file separately. I can have the I can have a separate configuration. So this would help in cases where you have where you have already the uh, or pre-configured configuration with you. So let's say you have um, you are using a configuration of another user and you and you are or like you want to test it out, you can simply ask them the configurations, uh, the config file, and you could use the config file to work with it. And that's more on the uh, con context structure and how things work. So I'll just make, I'll like take you through the uh, structure of the, um, how, like how the context look. So let me look. Um, make sure it's a config. So you have uh, three properties, con context, current context, and tokens. And in each context, you will have an endpoint, token path, platform. So this, this will be GK, uh, GK, Kubernetes, local, or Minikube, or anything uh, that's, that uh, hosts Kubernetes environment. And then you have adapters. So this is the list of adapters on a particular context. Then for each token, you would have a name and location. So location would be the path of token 
which uh, basically exist for that particular context so each context would uh, would or you can say may or might not have different uh, tokens so in in that case we could simply keep keep a pattern here which uh, so you don't need to pass in dash uh, like you for now now you will have to actually pass in token with uh, i don't know the token path uh, but once contexts are implemented you don't actually have to pass in token unless it's nil in the system right so if if, if we file like this you don't need to pass in the token it would simply be uh, fetched from your context this that's it <laughs> on context <laughs> nice uh, who has questions or feedback here Now, here's the thing. Um, generally, most of you get to slide on giving feedback. Not this time. <laughs> uh, everyone that's here, I'm hoping, uh, except for Ishan, who gets a pass, but I think even he is probably touched Meshri CTL. And so, what do you think? Uh, I haven't touched Meshri CTL. I've just uh, tried the dashboard and the Katakoda scenarios up till now. Okay. All right. So you, you definitely get a pass. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but for, for, for Dhruv, for Prayag, for Shridi, Udkarsh. Uh, one thing I had a question, why do we need a separate config file uh, for mystery CTL? Because I've used this to CTL and it just picks up things from your cube config. Yeah. Yeah, it just uses, I mean, it just uses your cube config file, whatever is it. And I think the cube config is using a very similar pattern to what uh, we just saw in the demo right now. And uh, it's already baked in and kubectl allows you to configure different, uh, uh, you know, context and everything related to Kubernetes uh, in that file. And we can just use that uh, with, uh, instead of, you know, coming up with our, or reinventing our own config format. Yeah, that's a good, um, that's a good set of thoughts to, that'll probably take us through the end of the meeting. That, that's great. Um, so one of the ways in which, and maybe that's the right thing to do, I'm not, I'm not sure, but talking through it, one of the ways in which Meshri is different from Istio is that Meshri actually by default today deploys to um, a Docker environment. Um, and if that Docker environment is running in Kubernetes, great, it'll run there and it'll, um, it's self-aware of its environment, meaning when it's Meshri server boots up, it'll look to see if it's inside of Kubernetes. And if so, it'll, you know, mostly behave the same, but it'll, it'll have a slightly different configuration. Oh, so we are not just limited to Kubernetes. We are also talking about Docker and others. Okay. Yeah. Then it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, but the thing is, is like, it's still, and you know, so the, the we're being heavily inspired intentionally from kubectl context. So, mm -hmm. so it's a great, it's a great highlight. Like, Hey, you know, this, you know, like, Hey, why even bother if, if you can, if users are already invested in and know kube config and you're basically trying to provide that. Um, but, but, I, but I even for my part, like I'd like to justify that even further because, because that, um, because just one justification isn't usually enough. Like, um, uh, it's that, okay. So if we, if we think about it. So, so you can, you know, you can deploy Istio you, and it'll take different configure. It's, it's a configurable deployment. You generally do that using a profile. So instead of an Istio context or an Istio config, there's an Istio profile, which was sort of formally, I think, built around uh, helm values.yaml. Yeah, and then I think you can just pass in a YAML as well, like a helm overrides kind of thing. Very similar so, to that, yeah. So it's it's possible that maybe they're getting the best of, well, having helped create the user experience group um, for Istio, I'll say historically that project has got, uh, you know, um, horrific UX. 
And so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't give them the benefit of the doubt of this next statement, but but maybe they've gotten it right in terms of a balance between um, leaning into you know cube config in this case and leaning into Kubernetes, uh, while at the same time also providing an optional path for basically what we're showing here, which is uh, the the ability to configure Istio and its um, now you know and its you know, and so to use the example, it's for Meshery right now, it's what adapters do you want to run with you know, no doubt other forthcoming configurable, you know, configuration parameters. Mm -hmm. So they've, Istio's got profiles, but they lean into making sure that you can just like get your Kubernetes connection kind of, you know, immediately because it's referencing the same file. Um, it might be that there's a learning to take from there because one of the because because meshery uh, when you deploy it it does seek out your cube config file and attempt to just use that and attempt to just assume that you know you might want meshery to talk to your to that kubernetes cluster that's your current context and it lets you choose between contexts but um it, but we're not while we took a very cube config centric approach to how it is that meshery server spins up. We're not entirely doing the same thing with meshery CTL. Um, and so, you know, as we think through this area, there, I th I th this is a, this is a, a good thought because um, one of the things that we've got going on right now, it's a little bit of a point of um, confusion that needs cleared up. It's, it's not the, I don't know. I don't know that it's the best user experience or, or not. So what, what, okay. So what I'm referring to is that when you want to, when Meshery server wants to communicate with the Kubernetes, it will, when you're running Meshery outside of Kubernetes, it asks for your cube config file and it expects that you'll have certificates in that file so that Meshery can, uh, you know, run as that user or mimic that user. You'll give it your, now, it, those certificates may or may not be inside of the cube config file. So if you're running Minikube as an example, um, those are generally referenced, uh, you know, to a, a, there's a file system reference to where those um, certificates are. Meshery server doesn't always have, may or may not have access to wherever those are. So we um, have provided an operation, um, and Anirud, I don't know if you're able to share again, but we, there's, Meshery CTL system config, uh, system config, and you'd say system config like Minikube, and it would, um, the CLI would help uh, minify, uh, like flatten and minify, export those um, certificates and get them into a new cube config so that then you can pass that to Meshery and to some of what we've been doing there. Um, we've been having Meshery server run some of that code to minify, to can help prepare environments. So, so this Meshery CTL system config, you can say system config EKS, AKS, GKE, Minikube, like these different Kubernetes environments that um, each of them have a little bit of a different preparation process for how it is that you would, you know, get your, get your cube config in, you know, configured in such a way that you can speak to those clouds or to those managed Kubernetes systems. And we're, you know, we're trying to help, you know, provide a nice user experience, helping people overcome those initial setup challenges. But some of that code runs in Meshery server, which means when you run Meshery CTL as a client, you actually need to have a, you need to have a token to be able to speak to Meshery's API and so you need to stand up Meshery, log into Meshery, grab your token, come back to the CLI, uh, run this. It, it's not that that's so awkward that you, you know, you, you know, if you've administered systems or integrated systems before, it's not awkward or uncommon that you'd go to one system, you'd get an API key, you'd copy that, you go to the other system, you paste it in, you know, that like not everything is as convenient as OAuth. Uh, but my point is, I, uh, I think it's time for an overhaul there. Like, 
that code probably that that ease of use code for configuring your connection to EKS or AKS or whatever probably needs to live within the Meshery CTL binary and not necessarily within Meshery server. I think both of those systems might need to be able to invoke those same those same functions. And maybe we were trying not to repeat ourselves, but it's probably causing a bad user experience. So as a related note to contexts, config files. Yeah, I mean, um, Ishan, another, like another, a, a melding of what you were saying is, hey, when you do mesh CTL system context create, and you're gonna create a new context. Well, you know, um, you'll give it a name. And then like Ani Rude was showing, you would you, you know, give it probably two other parameters, the URL to the meshery server endpoint and a token. Now, it might make sense right there that there, there, that we might, as we take next steps on the context command, we are intending to say, to identify like Anirudh had showed what platform it is that you're deploying to. So is that mesh server, that context that you're pointing at, is it um, a Docker environment or is it a Kubernetes environment? And so we would use this you know, platform as a parameter to track. Well, if it's Kubernetes, maybe we should just look to your cube config again kind of to your point about how Istio CTL approaches it there. Mm -hmm. So, so I don't, I don't know, I, I, I think this is, um, th try out the command a bit if you would, uh, be, a, be a, a devil's advocate of a user, be a bad user and be, be whiny. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll would, definitely give, give, it a, give it a look. I, I have not tried the command yet, so get a bit more insight once I try it, maybe. Yeah, yeah thanks. And that, that goes for um, Dhruv, you as well. Um, Anirudh needs feedback and feedback other than mine, because. I mean, the uh, whole centralized idea of having context was so, uh, currently, we have con system config, right? So we have measure CTL system config mini cube, or we have EKS, EKS or EKS. So we have a lot of different pro uh, providers. And uh, what we are trying to do a lot, what as I was aiming here is uh, once we have the foundation of context in place, we can um, actually aut automate the part on populating the context. So uh, if I have, uh, like, if I access the context, um, let's say I did a Minikube system config, uh, look, sorry, Meshri CTL system config Minikube, it would actually fetch the uh, IP of my Meshri server in Minikube. It would get the re uh, re required details and actually pre-populate the entire context. So next time when I, when I want to work on it or uh, whenever I'm working on it, I'll actually get the required uh, parameters already pre-populated, so I can simply work directly on my minikube instead of you know having to mess around with the configuration on my own. Yeah, you might run into a, a bit of a. That's great, Anirud. That um, watch out for the egg before the chicken before the egg challenge of like trying to go identify like trying to communicate with um, Kubernetes to identify where measure server is deployed uh, while trying to configure the connection to Kubernetes. Um, yeah. Anyway. Any other feedback for Anirudh? This is very much needed. We've been talking about this for a long time. It's been a very frequent ask that people are like, hey, I just want to use a few adapters this addresses that and uh, a lot more. So Anirudh, just to confirm, I think um, there's a stipulation in 
hear about some user acceptance tests. One of them, I'm just trying to refresh my memory. Okay, any given context includes an adapters collection with zero or more adapters defined. Mm -hmm. And if there is, okay, okay, to accept one or more, I guess what I'm trying to figure out, what, what I can't remember what behavior we specified. If you don't have any adapters, does that mean that if you don't have any? I think it's better to actually publish the uh, entire adapter uh, list because if they if, like also passing adapters uh, in a flag, it might not be the best way here because uh, it, how, how would the um, like if you have single flag like adapter one, adapter two, adapter three, it would be easier to address those in the CLI, but uh, addressing the entire array that that two pass in a flag is something different. So um, what we can do here is have a separate command for adding adapters, or maybe I'll have to look into if flags actually support an array input. Makes sense. Yeah. Or that this just really doesn't get used hey, to your point when you, and this is actually why I was kind of bringing it up is like, I don't think, I don't know that we specified it here. Maybe we did in the doc. Basically when you create, I think we did in the doc, it says when you create a context and you, you know, you give it a name that some of the variables may have, okay. That we would take from, we would have a hard, basically a hard coded config that includes by default, all the adapters. And that, yeah, if we do support uh, an adapters flag, that that would probably be rarely used or uh, used only, generally only used if someone wants to specify one, you know, because, uh, and or otherwise we just expect people to edit the config file. But yeah, it is valid though to run a meshery server with no adapters. Like meshery still performs some performance management without adapters. It does some things without adapters, so. Then we can just leave it to that, right? So uh, if adapters, like if the adapters are empty, then uh, it's basically zero, uh, running metric servers with zero adapters. And um, if there is any adapter, run those, or uh, maybe pass, pass in a flag that actually uh, uh, says like uh, push all or something like that. So push all adapters or something like that. That would actually add all the adapters to the adapters list and then create the environment. Yeah, yeah but by the, but let me be, but by default, let's just, just include them all. When someone does a create, in, mm -hmm. include them all. And then, um, yeah, which is the behavior. We can do that. But, um, but yeah, but it is valid to have zero adapters, so. All right, very good. We're, we're 10 minutes after. Um, anybody have anything else before we jump off? Other than we're not meeting on Friday. Have a Merry Christmas. Have some, some New Year's in there as well, probably. Um, we will not have the community meeting for two weeks in a row. So on the Friday community meeting, the next two Fridays, but we will uh, this, you know, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, those meetings are, no, I'm sorry, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. We're good. Thursday will be New Year's Eve, so we'll, we won't have the newcomers meeting, and Friday is New Year's Day, so we won't have the community meeting. So there'll be a lot of slacking in the meantime. Thank you for this, Anirudh. It's like a good work. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Bye, all. See you guys. All right, guys. Bye, everyone. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Happy New Year, baby. Yeah. Merry Christmas, everybody. Bye, guys.